Yeah. Hi everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Happy Friday. Uh, welcome to Beyond Baroque. Um, uh, Ivan Salinas, I'm programs manager here at Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center. Uh, welcome to the Wanda Coleman Theater and to tonight's program, Pratik, Darkness and Style. Uh, just going to share a few words and then I'll pass it to our uh, hostess of the night. I want to acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva peoples as the first peoples of this land. We acknowledge the wrong done to indigenous peoples through colonialism and genocidal practices. And as an arts organization, we are committed to uplifting their communities, stories, and cultures. Uh, for some of you that may be new to this space, we are a nonprofit literary arts space founded in 1968 by George Shirley Smith. This building used to be the original Venice City Hall building until the late 70s uh, when once Beyond Broke moved in and poets and artists reimagined it as a home for the arts. Uh, we've been here for 55 years and uh, you can find how we continue the legacy of this organization through our programming from readings uh, with emerging and established authors to exhibitions at the Mike Kelly Gallery Currently, we are in transition, in a transition period. Our next gallery will open um, next week. We're, we're going to be showing an exhibition of Gila Hirsch, uh, Gila Hirsch's work. Um, we are also offering opportunities for artists at different stages of their career. Currently, we are accepting applications for the Linda J. Albertano Fellowship, named after the poet and performance artist who was instrumental to the scene of LA poets and here at Beyond Baroque. And I'm sure Suzanne can attest to, uh, to this history as a nearly fatal, fatal woman. <laughs> uh, so you can find more info about this fellowship and also some of the events that we'll be having in March. Um, just to give a, a brief announcement of, of some of them, we will have uh, Shonda Buchanan and Matthew Kyer in conversation. Um, about their work as fiction and nonfiction authors, a reading with authors Sam Sachs, Josh Charles, uh, and, poetry in and poetry in translation with uh, subversive scribes, both in English and Spanish, and a stage reading of playwright Beth Henley um, on March 30th. And later in April, we're hosting the third edition of the Poetry Film Festival, and we'll uh, have tickets available in the next couple of weeks. Um, and lastly, I want to say thank you to the team uh, making the ship run uh, from our tech director, Eric Alberg, to Quentin, Jimmy, and Michelle, and uh, Genesis in the bookstore. Uh, huge shout out to, to all of them. Um, and of course, to you all for being here tonight, supporting the authors, supporting the space. Uh, there's a uh, couple of ways to do that. If you want to become a member, you can inquire about that in the bookstore and also uh, get copies of the books um, of the authors tonight. We don't have uh, copies of Pratik. Uh, they are in transit, but uh, they will be here. They will get, make it to the US. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and, and yeah, Susan maybe knows exactly where, <laughs> where they're at. <laughs> She's keeping track. <laughs> She's she has a tracking number too. Um, yeah. So I I just every time we have uh, Susanne here, it's an experience. And uh, whether it's tweets from hell, uh, this noir essence that she brings to the space, it's so fitting here at Beyond Broke. And uh, I'm sure you all will enjoy yourselves. So uh, please give a warm work, warm welcome to Susanne Limits. I like how he said something like, I bring this noir essence to Beyond Baroque and uh, to add to the uh, noir essence that is already here. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry about this. Not, I mean, the whole point of this was to for people to be able to come and buy it. It's very hard to find. I mean, uh, if you manage to get a hold of one eventually, you can probably sell it on eBay for you know, a couple of dollars more than you paid for it. I don't know. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think uh, that you you told me he said he sent it well ahead of time, and that at the same time he sent some other magazines to Spain, and they arrived in Spain. He said, so I don't know why they didn't arrive in Los Angeles, but there was some problem with the the plane in either. Kashmir or Laos or something like that, and uh, an adventure, I guess. Maybe an, they, they had a noir adventure, and he, he just said, you know, he did the best he could. Anyway, so what I really hope people will do is there is a, a sign up where I guess where you can put your. Is, is Genesis here anywhere? Does she know what? You ask her how to do it. it you, maybe you pay on your credit card, and then. The, they come in when the shipment comes in. They send it to you, but there is a sign-up sheet out there to get it. And I really recommend getting it for this reason. There's not much around that's like this. I can't think of. How about you, Gail? I can't see you out there in the darkness. You could be anywhere. But, but is have you ever seen another publication that draws together fiction? memoir, nonfiction, poetry, imagery, all exploring noir from different angles. Yeah, the no. world was waiting for you to do it. So <laughs> I guess. And the, the and, and the whole world did not they did not show up here tonight, but the important people, the people who were meant to be here, did show up tonight. Um, yeah, as far as I know, I don't know another undertaking quite like this. And it's uh it was a long time in the making, let me tell you, going back and forth between L.A. and Kathmandu quite a lot. Uh, so this is what's going to happen. Uh, Tony, you're now the very important position of second in line, but after Cece, because Cece has this poem called It's Noir. It's Noir, and it just... It just says it, eight ways from Sunday. So, um, so I'll put her up front to give people a sense of what the hell is noir anyway. And then when you hear your her poem, uh, that, will, uh, that will answer the question. What I'm going to do now is read, a, we're all going to read at least one poem by somebody else in here who cannot be here because maybe they live across. By the way, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. That's good. All right. I like to be heard. <laughs> um, I'm very uh, egotistic that way. I like to be heard. Um, I'm going to read a poem by the late Diane Blakely, who died fairly young. She got a terrible, one of these terrible illnesses where she was hooked up to an oxygen machine in her own home and really couldn't go any farther than the cord at the end of her life. And at that time, she started to email me, and we had a fascinating email correspondence in her last days. And it was really so important to her that I reached out to her because I found this poem in one of her books at a time I was looking for noir poems. And it is a sestina, meaning that six end words repeat over and over again through six stanzas in a rotating order. And I'll, I think I'll ask people at the end, it, just for the fun of it, because, you know, you can be in war and have fun, too, right? Can't you? Don't you think you can still have fun, even in a war mood? All right, so this is by Diane Blakely, who spelled her first name D-I-A-N-N. -N. Who, by the way, has seen uh, the big heat? What is it? The what? The big, not the big heat. The big sleep. Not the big sleep. Uh, body heat, body heat. I had to work my way through the heat, the heat. The, there's a lot of the, yeah. Body heat, who's seen it? Oh, good, then you will pick up on many of the references. And Diane Blakely spent some of her childhood in Florida and winds her memories together with the movie Duplex Noir. 
At dusk, stars fizzle in this landlocked sky, and TV screens turn blue like smoke rising from my neighbor's grill, smoke perfumed with meat, and already spoiled booze they bought enough, bourbon for black back-slapping men, gin and tonic for those first dates, white wine for moms who call their sitters every hour. You haven't called. My set darkens with Florida night sky, Hurt and Turner sweating over tonics slopped with rum, the tang of cut limes rising as they plot to kill her husband. Enough. I've seen body heat twice before, Maddie and Ned scheming to make Richard Crenna meat, dead burned meat between drinks and fucks and calls dialed from pay phones. I've never had enough of Florida, seared breeze and mackerel skies at sundown, my sand-crusted knees rising from castles left to watery tectonics as my parents gins lightly splashed with tonic picked at olives cheese coal sliced meats and sang my name their slurred voices rising like the waves channel eight Lauren McCall in Martinique, monochromatic skies, and rum runner Bogart, who's had enough of Vichy thugs, who's never been loved enough, as any dame can see. The movies are tonic, but addictive for little girls too shy to play with boys who cry into their meat at dinners years later when boys don't call. And when they do, when her father's shouts rise and shake her bedroom walls, the volume rises next door where they've had more than enough, the married and the single both. One call, that's all it would take. And what's more tonic than flesh on flesh? I could arrange to meet you any time. Stars vibrate in the sky. Now, among rising wires, trays of tonic and leftover booze, they've burned enough meat to call for pizza. <laughs> Late news. No end of skies. All right, uh, anybody, thank you. And Diane would love to know that her work is still being read. It's such a good poem, right? What do you think the uh, what do you think the end words were, the repeating, rotating words? Anybody know? Got any of them? Meat. Meat, that's one. Tonic, got two. Oh, somebody said, I think another one back there, I heard you right. Sky, somebody said sky, I think. Call. Call! And the other one is a hard one to guess, but it's enough, enough, yeah. All right, I am going to read uh, one of my poems and come back at the end and uh, read another, read my poem that's actually in the issue. So, Cece, have I forgot to say anything? Okay, one thing I should say, Cece was the assistant editor of this, and she caught many, many typos. And it was really hard to get them fixed, because sometimes Cece, right, we would fix the typos and send them back, and they'd be returned to me with even more typos than the, were there at the beginning, because uh, who knows? It's noir, that's all. It's just, yeah. <laughs> All right, so for this poem here, I was having fun with, uh, I, I got an idea in my head of, I, I want somebody, a speaker, who is confessing 
they're supposed to confess to a crime. That's why they're there to confess to the crime or to at least give valuable information to turn state's evidence or something like that. And this person, I realized as I was starting to write it, was going to evade <laughs> um, giving the information or uh, implicating themselves. But at the same time, I was reading some about some obscure grammar terms. So they got sort of wrapped in here. And then at the same time, I was reading about something having to do with uh, particle physics or something. So that also sort of fell into the poem. And it is called Noir Confession with Evasions. This story I'm about to tell, it's not true. And then that's a straight up truth, except for some parts that are, so I lied. This friend, she needed a hard pack of L&Ms, a gun that wouldn't jam, and a man that, you know, like, you know, strong jaw, broad shoulders, with brains as tough as he looked, but in the right way, and funny. Why not? She could use a good laugh. Okay, so now we're in Hmm, real time, present tense, the now of it ain't over yet. He feels her gaze on him, the way neon light looks at a shiny car, the way a dislodged gem stares at the full moon. He doesn't want to get involved, he just wants. The crime is as good as committed. And now for the Blue perfect past, so needy and imperfect. She had needed to bankroll her life, a life that had not been going to be cheap. It was all about mm, something, something, but this something kept slipping away like a dream. You know, the way those small atoms, the dreams, break apart and re-enter the atomic age. She needed to finance these words, and like the mugs say, words like hers don't come cheap. Sex like being pushed from a high window. I made that up. Like it? How much? Half moon, quarter moon, came then the night of no moon. It cameth. But really, you want the truth? Crime? Or no crime, caught or slipped out of there, running like raggedy water, there's no escaping the moon. Obviously, it worked out. Clearly, it all went wrong. <laughs> So I'm C.C. Perry, and uh, Suzanne <laughs> placed me at this, uh, and she's a tough act to follow, so I, I'm not going to thank you for it, Suzanne, but I'm here. Um, so I'm going to read two of mine and one of another poet from the, can you hear me? I guess I should stand here. Is that better? Yes. From, the, uh, anthology, from the fabulous anthology. Uh, this is by John Allman. It's called So. So it wasn't just the war or wearing a little officer's uniform, the leather strap across my chest like a seat belt so I wouldn't hit my head on the future. My sister turning so red from measles, she lit up the dingy back room where mother siphoned electricity from the hall fixture. It wasn't poverty that pulled darkness down. 
Maybe the slap across the face, my mother's glasses flying across the kitchen, my father swaying like a branch, some bird just left flying away from emptiness. But two nights later, I'd hear them grunting in the bedroom. So it isn't homily or forgiveness. That's not why my eyes dilated against the light, against the laws of the body and reason, or why they opened wide in the cigarette smoke of movie balconies, seeing what wasn't there. So, I was going to read My Body Heat, but I don't want to follow Diane Blakely either, so that I can control. I'm going to read another poem. This is called Trouble Down the Road. At the flat top grill, he was all business, flung raw eggs dead center into the corned beef hash like a strapping southpaw. In the alley with me, he was all ideas, said he'd be leaving soon, had a shot back east, a tryout for the big leagues, said his sister would loan him a Buick convertible and he'd fill it with malt beer and tuna. All he needed was a woman to hold, his cat, while he drove. <laughs> I like animals, I told him. <laughs> then I dropped my cigarette into the dusty clay, ground it out slow, felt the road under my foot. Uh, right. so, so, yeah, so this is my last poem. And this poem was inspired by a noir festival, which is what this anthology is becoming now, which is wonderful, because there'll be readings and readings. But this was one a couple of years ago, produced by Suzanne Lamas. And what I noticed during that festival was there was a lot of confusion about noir. Now, Suzanne was not confused, but there was a lot of other people that were very confused about what qualifies to be called noir. A movie or a book, is it noir or not? I wrote this poem to help poets are helpful. Uh, and in this poem, there are elements that if you see them in a book or in a movie, it could probably call, be called noir. Now, there's a lot of them. You don't need them all, and one or two may not be enough. It's a critical mass thing, so this is it. It's noir, and there's a, an epitaph. For some people, it's hard knowing what's noir and what's not. Max Bloom. If there's a hitchhiker, border crossing, or sudden change of plans, if someone's named Vera, the wall, or Lola Molina, if there's a knife fight, gunfight, or bare knuckle justice, if a guy lights a match with his thumb, if someone's after payback, a payroll, or the lay of a lifetime, if the dead are buying land out in the valley, if there's a car, a cliff, and a claims adjuster, if, if, if a wife buys a black veil before she needs a black veil, if it's night, if it's rainy, if the music's complicit, the drugs are illicit, the whole setup suspicious, if the guy you're rooting for winds up hugging a manhole cover, if even the moon ends up in the gutter, and if nobody ever had a chance to begin with, it's noir. <laughs> Hello.
There we go. Instead of introducing the poems, I thought it might be fun to read some sentences I spoke into my phone driving over here. <laughs> Think of them as palate cleansers, ginger between bites, practicing for death with acupuncture needles. Man, it's raining cats and toasters out there, and it's dark as a preacher's dreams. The horse forgives the whip, the worm forgives the plow, but dream on, asshole, I'm not forgiving you know how. She traded my heart for an unfiltered cigarette and a nicotine smile. So, this poem is called The Death Trap. The Death Trap. Falling for Rose just might be fatal, but what's not? I'm just an airman with a knack for trouble and a killer uppercut. I know that Spider Floyd is on our track, but spend the afternoon in Rose's dive because you can't keep days inside a box. Maybe to love a tramp's a paradox, but no one's getting out of here alive. I'm not just killing time with Rose. Time does the murdering. Rose stitches up the cut across my heart. I hold her tight in bed because I've learned of love one thing. It goes. It's true. Time is a great teacher but unfortunately kills its students dead. <laughs> what am I to you? Brown tissue on your shoe? The inside of an outhouse? She said, I think I could be a junkie. I just don't have the discipline. <laughs> I had a dream last night about a Big black knife looking for a home in your eye. By Kim Adonizio from her story titled The Wishing Well. That's the same story, the same song. Hold on a minute. Should be a different one. All right, I need you. Okay, looks like we're doing this one. I'm sorry about the money, Nick says. You're such a dick, I say. Then he kisses me and we go to bed. Afterwards, I lie awake. Nick is snoring a little. I hear cars on the street. I imagine my heart like the moon, the surface all fucked up from space rocks. The moon has no atmosphere. Red lights swirl around the bedroom. Elena mourns Anton with a house full of people and a lot of potato salad and ribs. I bring her a bag of food from the Alameda Food Bank, tangerines, chocolate fudge, jello pudding, cans of tuna and vegetables. At her church, they play tambourines and talk about Jesus' love. There is no God. Nick and I bought a grill, which means he's moved back in. Next time I'll bring you a barbecue turkey, I tell Elena. I ain't never had no barbecue turkey ever, Elena says. Hey, you got to frost it first? We're getting a fresh one. Fresh, where you get that at? Andronico's in Berkeley, which means in a galaxy far, far away. Darnie comes to live with Elena. They get out the glue and glitter and colored markers. Elena cornrows Darnique's hair. She makes her Eggo cinnamon toast waffles for breakfast. Everything works out fine, except in the end, it doesn't. Elena will get diabetes. Darnique will be pregnant by 14. I'm nobody's fucking fairy godmother. 
This is the part uh, where the gun goes off because I'm drunk and mad at Nick again after he's been a hack for, back for a couple of months. It turns out he has another girlfriend. Everyone leaves me sooner or later. I kind of wave the gun around and scream at him. Then I aim it at my head, but I change my arm, my mind, and aim at him instead. Years before, Elena tried to kill herself. The recoil of the gun jerked her hand away from her temple. The bullet only grazed her neck. It left a little scar. So I knew how to hold the gun steady. It's a longer story, but I thought that was a nice section. <laughs> She gave me a look that tightened my scrotum and loosened my smile. Better that way than the other way around. <laughs> look, I understand. A lot of people have trouble with charity. That's why I have a gun. She pins a smile on her face the way you pin a butterfly to a cork board. I feel her still. A bullet in the spleen. This is called A Whole Florida of Despair. Another one of my poems, but not in the anthology. If I can find the right music. Here we go. A Whole Florida of Despair. The eye was suppurating, gluey, viscous tacky tears that made the, clean with, the queen with goss, glossy bamboo sheets seem a whale's deathbed swarmed with sea snails and bristle worms. The eyelashes were a sieve clotted with weeping. No double rainbows from that rain. No stubby crayon drawings of messy happy hearts and I love you flowers. I slogged to the bathroom and dunked my face, but the eyes of the smudged ghost in the mirror kept leaking like they were suffering a whole Florida of despair. That's when the doorboards shivered and spoke, and something rattled the walls and tore at the lattice. There was weeping and screeching out on the lawn. I walked out with a flashlight, Iguanas scampering into weeds, the ocean's aria, palm trees tossing their dark hair, and found her by the pump house, shoeless, shrieking, socks sandy and wet, face a glaze of shining tears. Are you okay? Can I help you? Can I call someone? She looked up and whimpered, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Eyes stark with catastrophe, body shaking like a dying horse. Inside the pump house, a voice shouted, I'll call the cops! Later, the boyfriend yelling, I'm not leaving without her! And the young policeman smiling, some young people having too much fun. So, I wandered off to my own sickness unto death. And that's when the storm really broke the sky. Bloodshot, lightning, splitting like nerves, rain, shouting on the roof. And all night long, the sun hid away behind the planet like a phantom hope. And all night long, the moon was a pupil swelling against the retinal dark. And the darkness gazed also. And in the morning, the eye kept leaking, leaking. Thank you, Beyond Baroque and Suzanne. <laughs> so, good evening, everyone, and uh, happy International Women's Day. So I'm going to be reading a couple of poems from the anthology, uh, the first one by me and the other one by Dorianne Lux. 
And uh, my poem was inspired by the shadow side of the imagination. Um, I kind of wanted to explore the beauty of the dark, and uh, this is called Muse Noir. Every time I write, I sense his hand sliding up my thigh, blackening each metaphor. He hammers my good girl past until it shatters like a glass mug. I can't shrug him away. One night in Lahore when I was 15, he climbed beside me in bed, fastened a palm around my wrist. It was the only time I saw his face, the square brown chin and espresso stained grin, the cunning smile that colonized my head. I said, when I get back to California, I'll grind you up like a bean. But he just waved a palm-sized cross and proposed. I said, yes, of course. Still, he stood me up for prom. I wore the ruby dress with the side slit and waited on the porch, waited and waited until my thoughts took off their heels and like a corpse stood still. For months, he did not show. I spent the evening sketching black tulips, drinking coffee. The cafe, the one place he was likely to be. The air prayer whipped with the nuns who liked to visit, play chess in the corner. There the lighting was lunar. One night, reading a ghost story in the back, my thoughts woke electric. I put on lipstick, pressed it on even two. His hand gripped my neck. The fear delicious, the joy rose up so fast I couldn't move. If I stay, he said, you'll carry delusions, make mad like Edgar Allan Poe. I told him I wasn't the kind of girl who wanted a rose. He laughed at my quiver, handed me a silver ring, something gothic. We didn't kiss. It would have been uncouth with the nuns watching. But the verdict was in. My conscience mugged by a thief. I was wife to spinning dark, to gunfire on the street. And I'm going to read a poem by Dorian Lux. So I chose this one because it precedes mine in the anthology. And I thought I would be a good neighbor. And it's, it's Dorian Lux, right? Um, and it's called Homicide Detective, a film noir. Um, and anything that uh, centers around the figure of the detective I love. I've been a mystery junkie since I was a kid, so um, I'm excited to read this one. Homicide Detective, a film noir by Dorian Lux. Smell of diesel fuel and dead trees on a flatbed soaked to the bone. Smell of dusty heater coils. We got homicides in motels and apartments all across the city, under the beds, behind the doors, in the bathtubs. It's where I come in at 5 a.m., paper cup of coffee dripping down my sleeve, powdered half-moon donut in my mouth, blood everywhere, bodies belly down, bodies face up, on the kitchenette floor. Donde esta? Que sera? We got loose ends, we got dead ends, we got split ends. Hair in the drains, fingerprints on glass. This is where I stand, my hat glittery with rain casting my restless shadow. These are the dark hours, dark times are these, hours when the clock chimes once as if done with it, tired of it, the sun, the highways, the damnable flowers strewn on the fake wool rug. These are the flayed heart's flowers, oiled black dahlias, big as fists, stems thick as wrists, striped, torn, floating in the syrupy left on music. But the bright world is done, and I'm a ghost touching the hair of the dead with a gloved hand. These are the done for, the poor, the defenseless, mostly women, felled trees, limbs lashing up into the air, into rain, as if time were nothing. Hours, clocks, highways, faces, don't step on the pedals, the upturned hands, stay behind the yellow tape, let the photographer's hooded camera pass the coroner in his lab court, the DA in her creased black pants. 
Who thought to bring these distracting flowers? Who pushed out the screen and broke the lock? Who let him in? Who cut the phone cord, the throat, the wrist, the cake on a plate, and sat down and ate only half? What good is my life if I can't read the clues? My mind the glue and each puzzle piece chewed by the long gone dog who raced through the door, ran through our legs and knocked over the vase, hurtled down the alley and into the street. What are we but meat, flesh and the billion veins to be bled? Why do we die this way, our jaws open, our eyes bulging, as if there were something to see or say? Though today the flowers speak to me, the way they sprawl in the street light, their velvet lips and lids opening as I watch, as if they wanted to go on living, climb my pant legs, my wrinkled shirt, reach up past my throat, and curl over my mouth, my eyes, bury me in bloom. Thanks. Wow, you were right, Cece, the light is brutal. <laughs> it's noir. Yeah, it's noir. <laughs> um, I'm Marilyn Robertson. I'm going to read two of my own poems in Pratique, and then um, one by Susan Eisenberg, which is longer, mine are short. The first one. I was walking up um, Mount Washington Drive, and there was a fire in Griffith Park. And, and smoke and um, ashes were coming over, and I thought, what would it be like to be an arsonist? <laughs> so this poem is called That Itch or The Arsonist. Shadows reach, dapple the asphalt. Hawks whoop, surfing air. Tumbleweeds cling, ready to roll. Desert breath blows, treetops twist, sweat salts my skin, I itch. All it takes is one red spark. I kneel down. As the wind picks it up, I withdraw. Watch what I've unleashed on every channel. No one knows, nothing can stop it. I burn, I don't need anyone. Closer now, so high, I can't stop. <laughs> the second one um, is called What Happened That Night. And um, I got the first line from um, a workshop and but the rest of it just poured out of me, except for the very end, which is Suzanne's. <laughs> what happened that night? As he was packing to leave me, I threw my negligee, negligee on the passenger seat of the car. I slipped it off. Like a nylon shadow, my pale skin liberated, illuminated in the moonlight like a satellite of a satellite, which is what I was starting to feel, myself a body visible only by reflected light, his shape a shadow moving in and out of sight behind the blinds, the backbeat of drawers and doors banging, hanging, hangers, liquid slides, a music playing as I waited in the darkness. Let him leave. I'd had him with him anyway. His sullen moods, his unreasonable demands. He told me he never wanted to see me again. Well, he'd see me. He'd see me all right. I'd like, to find, like him to find a way not to see me. I'll be the moon. Where did that come from? I don't know. I'm happily married. <laughs> My parents weren't. The last one is by Susan Eisenberg, and it's, it's called Nightmare Alley. And I saw this movie, and um, so I was very attracted to the poem, and here it is. Masked at the movies, we've come for noir, 
But from the first time we see Cooper's doomed con man stand coolly eyeing the geek, it, it, chained in his cage, stands fate is clear. And I know I've made a mistake. <laughs> the seats are plush, and I admire Del Toro's artistry, the moody lighting, the strange, hellish fires. But the wine I'm sipping burns all the way down as we watch the geek's sad attempt to escape. The still sober stand helped to us capture him. No mercy for the geek, or for us, as the unforgiving camera shows us how he's thrown, screaming back into his cage. Any noir fan knows now what comes next, that we must watch as Stan moves inexorably toward a cage of his own, becomes the next geek, the cruel crowd, and we have come to see. It's been a bad week. A poet I know has tweeted that Anne Frank had white privilege and a killer well-armed by his father and dressed in crude drag for whatever sick movie plays in his damaged head, has shot up a Fourth of July parade, the kind where small town majorettes and a volunteer firefighters throw candy to children crowding in the, at the curbs. Photos of a sudden, suddenly orphaned lost toddler filled my feed. I watched as Hearings proved all I had feared about the autocrat my countrymen and women elected. Their director doesn't mean us to sympathize with Stan. He's murdered his own father, burned the corpse and his childhood home around it. He's no good and grows worse. Are we entertained at, as the satanic candy bo carny boss lays out his simple steps for creating a man who'll devour a living bird. Find a desperate algae, he says. Lace, lace his booze with morphine. Promise the gig is only temporary. And he's yours, he grins. Too late to change his mind. The poor sucker starves in the darkness, released into an earthen pit for two shows a day to chase, catch, and tear his teeth in and tear with his teeth the neck of a shrieking cock. To gulp with blood ravenous as the local rubes crowd around him transfixed. The wine sours my tongue, but we stay till the end, watch as Bradley Cooper smiles, his still movie star handsome smile, and reaches for the doctored bottle and says, I've been hitting here all my life. Hi. Thank you, Suzanne, for including me in this anthology. My poem is a slightly different take on noir. Um, in this poem, the dead body is love. It's called The Poem Rings Twice. Still, there's a crooked footprint and a dark sidewalk where love had left me. Where unconscious and bound did it go? Perhaps it can be found in the blue algae of the river shallows. Sometimes love pressed against me, yielding only an enigmatic argument. Sometimes I watched, sometimes it watched as I stacked bracelet upon bracelet on my arms. I sleep in its absence, not suspecting that I carry in my dreams the blade of life ever after. Other mysteries remain, fluid, full, inessentially outside me, where my narratives reimagined are no thicker than glass pipe stems. Alone in the shadows, I have stopped speaking. When I question the guessing, the wait, an aching begins. It moves from palm frond to street sign, which the detective this time will not interrogate. Thank you. <laughs> 
And I'm going to read some sections from David Lehman's uh, poem in the anthology called The Double Agent, a screenplay for Michael Caine. And the reason I'm reading this is because the first line of the poem taught me something I'd never realized, which is that Wallace Stevens' 13 ways of looking at a blackbird is noir. <laughs> It was evening all afternoon. It was snowing, and it was going to snow, right? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So his first line is, it was going to snow, and then it didn't snow. He loved her like a dying man's last cigarette. The dog was planning his next betrayal. It was, he reasoned, in the nature of dogs to betray their bitches. The man at the bar was wearing a dark suit and tie as thin as the excuses given by an unfaithful mate to her homicidal husband on the phone. You want results? You have to pay for them. All right, but are you sure this is the guy? This is the guy. And in he walked, wearing eyeglasses and speaking with a Cockney accent. He had made his bones when he killed his wife with a light bulb in the cellar, made it look like an accident, got away with it, and celebrated by pushing a man in front of a speeding train. He could see it from the balcony, freedom. There it was across the river in the brown haze of dusk, a row of dead birches like the bars of a gate with blue water and green hills behind it. Was it worth it? You didn't ask yourself. You just grabbed your case and went. You didn't even know the date, the month, and year until you got there. Afterwards, if you were lucky, there would be time to remember. Well, he would have to do the remembering for the whole unit. And once a year in a hotel room in Switzerland, he would take out the girl's photograph and shake his head. <laughs> That's David Lehman. And then I'm going to read one short poem from this little book that uh, Chuck Rosenthal and I did together, The Shortest Farewells Are the Best. It's flash noir fiction. And um, every line in every poem is a line spoken in a noir movie. So wait a minute. This is called My Friends Call Me Kitty. She talks to me just once, and like that, she's dead. Do you look down on all women or just the ones you know? <laughs> what do these look like? Grapefruit? <laughs> I'm not married. I have no designs on you, and one drink will do it. This is some conversation we're having. Now I'm supposed to know what I'm talking about. Give him a drink. You heard me. Give him a drink. I'm glad we're getting close to something. It's much better to have looks than brains, because most men I know can see better than they can think. <laughs> Um, thank you, Suzanne, for including me. Uh, my name is Christina Cha. I um, have a piece of memoir in here, not a poem. Um, but I'll, I'm going to start by reading Lynn Emanuel's piece in here. How's the sound? I'm, I'm a quiet talker. Yes? OK. <laughs> Can you? All right, Lynn Thompson, the um, I think just recently, poet laureate of LA. I think she's done. OK. Um, the ways of remembering women. And I wanted to read this, or I'm only going to read half of it. I wanted to read this to um, uh, just help me understand more about it, to understand more while I read it aloud. The ways of remembering women. Do you want to know about the Black Dahlia, or do you want the truth about Elizabeth Short? You may not be aware there is no such Dahlia, and yet lovers of crime focus on the dark of it, the mystery connecting this short to its rare essence, which some say means enduring grace. 
I thought it was the newspapers who coined it, eager to make a buck featuring the brutality of the, that January 1947, but no. It was the sailor men who frequented the waterfront along the Long Beach Pier who gave the raven-haired Betty her final moniker. They could have called her Rose for the tattoo on her left calf, could have called her Star for those who said she was an actress, well-behaved and sweet, despite the hideous tableau she was found in, her torso, head, and legs savagely detached, each from the other, her body drained of blood, her mouth slashed from one ear to the other ear, skull pulp-like as it roiled in the tall grass of Leinart Park. Did you know she was pregnant, her fetus removed post-mortem by her killer, that a Chandler, yes, one of those Chandlers, was rumored to be the daddy, and still we can't get enough of her, of anything that made her macabre. See Time Magazine 2015, describing many confessors to her murder, everyone looking for their main line to notoriety. See how, even now, you want to know who did it, as well as the horrific facts. Short was alive when a butcher's knife scrolled Calyx to Corolla. Um, and now I will read from like, uh, <laughs> um, I'm nervous today. I've done this a million times. I don't know why I'm so nervous today. Um, uh, yeah, this is an excerpt from a longer work, a collection of poetry and prose that's coming out the end, at the end of summer, hopefully. And, um, I also just uh, released a film that I was a part of, a documentary, a feature length documentary called You Are My Audience, which is based on uh, my writing about my aunt, who I'm about to read about. And um, anyway, it's on like Apple and Amazon and other digital forms. So please watch it. Um, who were you, writer, artist of the avant-garde, Teresa? Murdered November 5, 1982. Raped and murdered. You are my Aunt Teresa. You are married. You are dead. These two new facts next to each other, separated by six months, collapsed by kid time, fuse over the years. My parents first tell me about rape. I don't recall the sex talk, but I remember the rape talk when I'm 10. You are married when I'm 10. I am your flower girl. Your dress is a plain white sheath with a scooped neck. The stiff cloth stands away from your body and the sleeves end just above your wrists. The important part is the high lavender sash with diagonal hatch marks of deeper purple. Lavender is your favorite color. Iris is your favorite flower. You don't want much at your wedding, you say, but you want these things. Purple is my favorite color and rainbows and unicorns are important to me. It is 1982. Your sisters stand close to you, binding and unbinding the cloth around your waist. Grandma frowns as she watches because the cloth is a kimono sash. Ma, it's not a kimono, it's Teresa's own style. It's not Japanese, says Aunt Bernadette. Living as a Korean under Japanese rule is still fresh for Grandma. I am there when you pick out your shoes, lavender suede high heels that almost look like boots and are very expensive. Bernadette handles them like something precious, making her hands cupped and floating and beautiful. Dad writes a book. I don't know when he starts. The book looms always there. The book, the book. A call and response between me and Dad repeated into distortion from a terrible movie where a lumpy-faced troll shakes a magical tome at the sky, proclaiming the book, the book. The manuscript of his years of trials, seven by the end, as a witness, a brother, the book his way to process and distance and keep it close. The book fills the house until it settles in the office behind the office in the addition that he builds where he does most of his writing. Incarnations of typewriter progressively smoother and quieter and then a fat monitor with a tiny blue screen. Dad builds the back room without the proper permits even though he is an engineer and knows what's what Years later, he is asked to destroy this room before he sells the house, and he does. Our house, the same as every other house in the block, except for this room. The first time I read the book, I'm 17. I ask for it. I want to know. The trials are over, the sentencing. 
I want to know. I bring the binder into bed with me like a normal book, reading into the night, although I close it carefully and push it away from my bed instead of letting it fall on my chest to follow me into sleep. Still, it stays behind my eyes and in my body, and the nightmare that comes is enormous. The table, my parents, the hutch. Three of us sit around the table, just me and my parents, without my brothers. Is it a settee or an armoire? A hutch. The hutch under the window that frames the backyard. The furniture is always moving, so the hutch could be against the wall. I'm always in the same chair. I learned to read in this chair, in a book shaped like a fat ginger cat. The and cat, my first words. I'm sitting there when they tell my brothers and me, you died in a car accident. I'm sitting there when they recant, days or weeks later. The table is bare, the backyard trees dry and wild. It was not a car accident, they say. You were raped and murdered. Raped, then murdered. Raped and murdered. I go up to my room. I have a new diary I've been saving, a square block of tan hardcover and thick cream pages. Butterflies stamped onto the front, orange and black and purple, outlined in gold. I write slowly. I bear down hard with blue ballpoint. Today, my parents told me Teresa was raped and murdered. Hello, everybody. I'm Allison Turner, and I'm going to read first a poem from the anthology by Lynn Emanuel, the incomparable Lynn Emanuel, and then I'll read a couple of my poems. Big Black Car, the epigraph, anything with wheels is a hearse in the making, Richard Miller. I thought, you'll never get me anywhere near that motor's flattened skull. The hose's damp guts, the oil pan with its tubes and fluids. I thought, I'll never ride the black bark jello of the treads or be locked up behind its locks and keys or stare at the empty sockets of those headlights, the chrome grill so glazed with light it blurs, oily, edible, about to melt. You'll never get me into that back seat. The ruptured upholstery hemorrhaging batting is not for me, nor the spooky odometer, nor the gas gauge letters spilled behind the cracked milky glass. The horn, like Saturn, is suspended in its ring of steering wheel, and below it, the black tongue of the gas pedal the bulge of the brake, the stalk of the stick shift, and I thought, you'll never, but here I am. And there in the window, the tight black street comes unzipped and opens to the snowy underthings, the little white stitches and thorns of a starry sky. And there, beyond the world's open gate, eternity hits me like a heart attack. <clears throat> and this is my poem from the anthology. It's called Stray Bullet. Stray Bullet, meaning it didn't mean to, meaning there was a hole in the air, meaning it was lost before it knew what was happening. And then this <clears throat> poem is called, it's another car poem as it turns out. Um, it's called The God of Rats. Tree rats crouch under the hood of my car. In the heat and oily smell the engine gives up after dark, they spit out the husks of palm nuts scavenged from the yard next door. 
After that, they will sharpen their incisors on my compressor hose and take a nap. I am thinking of ways to kill them. I handle the traps with tongs and outsized gloves, employing the vocabulary of destruction like a god who must distance himself to work. I will save my car. To the north, fire clouds spark on their columns of smoke. Rain evaporates before it hits the ground. Rats worship their own god. He gives them soft skulls that flatten through cracks, the cunning to hunker down in enemy exhaust. To the north, the pall of smoke is so dense, it's midnight at 4 p.m. everybody. I brought my accoutrement. Suzanne, thank you uh, for all your work on this and uh, including me. Great poetry tonight, huh? Yeah. Wow. You've heard so much already. Um, I'm going to read my little poem from the book to start with. And uh, both these poems uh, were in, well, I've actually written two little noir poems, and they're both in the same place. And it's the house my Uncle Irving lived in. And Uncle Irving was always in the back room with cigarettes and a lot of strange noise. And we thought he was always doing something illegal. So that house makes me think of crime. The milkman always rings twice. A birthmark or a bruise, capped under a white brim. He crouches in the shadow of a stucco portico on Garth Avenue. A trigger sits deep in his pocket after a string of quick decisions disheveled with intent. There is no account he wouldn't attempt to verify. This is why she'd loved him. And this is where it stopped short. In red lights, blue in the face, red flags now a no-go from the get-go. The man bent over her like a father to a stranger, her tresses matted in the sludge, then his breath catches in the sirens, his oxfords take the cement steps in one lunge, he walks around to the service entrance and leaves her usual two quarts. <laughs> And um, it is the International Day of Women. And uh, so I wrote this today. I'm in the midst of writing 30 poems in 30 days for Tupelo Press as a fundraiser. I don't know if I would recommend it. <laughs> um, this is called, I think it might be a noir exchange. Um, and it's about one of my favorite women, the earth. Clouds of gray smoke, toxic entropy absorbed into the atmosphere, an astrophysical interchange of molecules playing do -si do landing random where they can do some harm. Harmful chemicals known to man, used by science, science anyway, create, destroy, create, pollute, create byproducts for bystanders and Bibles we thrum in the name of Jesus while walking heavy-footed on the face of the mother. 
Oh, instead, sing her praises, her purple rocky mountains, her sky-tickled canyons, her mesa pools reflecting, her moor and glaciers, miracles of natural formation. Oh, sing to the sediment, the molten and the aqueous, the first mind idea in the eye of the arcana held as it comes into focus in the hands of the future, and the future seeks the non-existent way back down, by which I mean there is no way back, only the way on, eight limbs and eight koshas, eight in an octave on the Fibonacci ratio, shrouded, hidden and holographic, the none and the multiplied, the raptures of the many, the deep end of sorrow that seeks its opposite in beauty. What I understand about shame is it's a kind of fertilization that drives us to motion, clones us to the afternoon, disappearing on the horizon. Even the sun shines itself into setting, lets the night run amuck in the dark at the break of its curfew to bring a new start, another arbitrary 24 hours, further severed by 60 twice. It's dangerous to keep broken watches around the house. Bad luck, a travesty to let time stand still. Or is it we who idle while time creeps on and on and just when it seems the darkest again? There goes our luminous blue mother on her axis in Adagio. You can feel her turning in space beneath your feet. So um, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a first draft, really first. Uh, I, I have to. Um, change for this next piece. It, it's a, a bit of a stretch. <laughs> but I love this poem. It's by Yusef Komunyaka, The Cage Walker. He shoves the 38 into his coat pocket and walks back into the dark night, takes him, night takes him like a conveyor belt. For a split second, he's been there in the ditch, hood pulled from over a death's head. He sits on a park bench, blue uniform behind every elm, night sticks. He thinks how a man enters the deeper, darker machine. His fingers touch gun metal. He stands and walks down toward the wharf. Ships rock in white foghorn silence. Water slams, steel doors closing in a tunnel. The quarter moon goes blank behind a cloud. He frames a picture in his head, retraces footsteps to Shorty's liquor store. He will go in this time. He stands under a street lamp. Moths float by and he counts cars. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, oh, shit. A woman walks past and smiles. Her red dress turns the corner like a blood in a man's eyes. He stares at his hands. They say August is a good time for a man to go crazy. That was a nice reading of Yusef's poem, Peggy. Strong reading. Not an easy poem to read. Interesting to have a poem in here written by a man uh, imagining the psyche of a killer, along with poems uh, in here that 
some of them have to do with murdered women. Um, I, I didn't uh, mention the name of the editor, of uh, the longtime editor of Pratik, uh, which is Yuyutsa Sharma, and he keeps us going with various uh, uh, around uh, editors, uh, guest editors around the world, really. It's had Irish issues and um, Italian uh, poetry uh, with Italian editors and so on. And I hope people will subscribe to it. It takes a little while to come from Kathmandu, but it, it reaches you eventually, you know, comes sometimes on a slow boat, but finally you get it. And, and, and you know, it will give you a sense of what's going on all over the world. Uh, I am going to finish up with a poem of mine, the one that is in Pratik. Um, and I start became interested in, in the noir voice uh, when I began reading Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett, uh, these uh, classic crime writers, uh, private eye writers, uh, and pulp fiction writers of the 40s and 50s, and found another voice that I hadn't heard in poetry, and came to realize after a while that this voice, this approach, this approach stripped of all sentimentality uh, or any self-pity would enable me to talk about things in poetry that I don't see talked about very much. There's very little uh, in contemporary poetry about crime. Only in certain certain areas where uh, the it, it's, it's a recognized category, for instance, war poetry or anti-war poetry, that I think editors recognize. And um, probably recognize uh, biographical poems, autobiographical material about suffering abuse as a child, for example, that's very recognized, and I think social justice poems. But this other area of crime, which has been with us, when did it start, everybody? Somewhere around the dawn of time? Like the, again there, some more or less, you know? Uh, circa year one. Um, and yet there's very little, and it's often I find that my poems aren't quite understood or recognized by editors sometimes because it's so different. If, unless they can figure out that it's in the noir mode. Um, I'm going to read just a couple of paragraphs from my uh, opening called Darkness and Style, just so that people will leave here having a little bit more of a specific definition of what I mean by noir. And, you know, you can talk to 12 people and get 12 different <laughs> ideas about it. And maybe they would all get into a fight about it and then kill each other, you know? <laughs> Wouldn't that be strange? Um, so I'll read the first paragraph and then another one. Noir, it's a style, usually spare, devoid of sentiment, pity, especially self-pity. It's atmosphere, a mood with hints of transgression in the air and maybe the scent of burning cigarettes, classic era camels or lucky strikes, pre-surgeon general's warning. And the subject, crime. If no crimes in progress, recent or eminent, then some sense of danger will do, unease. If no specific danger, then a sense of inevitable failure will do. And then I have a little bit more about the dark side of Noor. Um, and all along, I've had reservations about this realm that's absorbed me for some decades. Film Noir festivals, private eye and crime story, fast reads, book series, gathering short fiction set in various cities, Brooklyn Noir, Boston Noir, Baghdad Noir, just to name a few of the bees. It sounds like fun. It's not. In life, it's not. When you yourself are the victim of violence or someone close to you is, the entertainment value 
drops precipitously. All right, that's an enticement to to get this get this rare uh, publication. Uh, this one that closes the and I have to say, I. No, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Never mind. I was going to say something, but I'm not going to say it now. Um, my cat. Some a couple of you have heard this story. I had a. I, I love. I've loved all my cats so much, but I had this one cat. I love that cat too, but it did chew up a pair of vintage heels that I really loved, and I was so sad about that. I was so sad that I had to do something for myself for therapy. Give myself, I couldn't afford a real therapist, so I had to be my own therapist. And I decided I'm going to write the poem for the woman that in the 1940s, because these were very vintage shoes, could have worn those shoes. And, um, and I knew that she would be a, I knew this would be a noir poem. And I tend to, anytime I read about a murdered woman, I don't know what's the matter with me, but I always think that could have been me. Clearly, I guess I really do need a therapist. Um, but it always seems like, why, why her and not me? Oh, all right, this is a story of this woman, and it's called Red Heels, named... Fool and you fool, they starred in the usual stories. Phone number lipstick across a mirror, dark corridor, flame snapping from a silver lighter. This one just wants to hook the low catch of a bar stool and take a load off. That one wants to swing from a black stocking toe, somebody's old-fashioned girl. Call them get down and stood up. Something chiseled them sleek. Those ice pick heel sharp toes must have a point to make. What could they love? That one, a glass paperweight with a red T-E-A-R at its core. Tear as in weep. Tear as in rip. This one, its image in the ladies' room full-length mirror at a Greyhound rest stop cafe. Call them Cracker Jacks and Jackknife clicking their own jukeboxy code, talking to each other, to themselves. This one wants to slow dance among the cigarette butts. That one wants to slide in the back of a cab and hear her yell, Drive! They just want to slip down the shadow side of a boarded-up cinema and come out on the same two feet. And you traveled inside them? Mr. Wrong turn, you going my way. Collar unclaimed, unsolved. The coroner's cool and rested barefoot girl. But oh, those high heels, heart stroked, color of deep aortal. Sangre. They just want to keep dancing. Right. Sign up to get this. Sign up to get this publication. It's a good one. It's the only. It's the only anthology or literary magazine that I've ever edited, selected all the work for, where I didn't, in the end, feel that in the past I felt that I had a couple bad poems in there. I went, okay, there's a couple bad poems. I don't think there, there's not a single poem in here, not a single work that's not strong. All right, well, um, 
It's almost over. Have you all seen Touch of Evil? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Um, I was just, just thinking about this movie while we were, you know, listening to more poems. Would you be mad if I shared the poem I just wrote? <laughs> but I would, you know, even if I... Even if I made you mad, I still would. Yeah. <laughs> if you're mad, it might be noir. Yeah. Okay. It is on touch of evil. It's the stink that stays with me. Hank, Quin Hank Quinlan's stink, that is. The lies in a movie set, all the makeup and made up stash, fake blood, and the thought I'm watching it not the way Orson intended it after all. Venice on celluloid looks a lot like the border. Mike Vargas could be more Mexican. Imagine he was a mafioso taking a short drive to Mar Vista to eat La Yudas on the hood of a Cadillac. He'd die with a happy stomach, killed by a sex worker facing forceful eviction at Chavez Ravine. Baseball, they say, is just what El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora, La Reina de Los Angeles, needs today. Mike loved to play ball. Now he's got to bite the bullet. Let's forget about the red ocean behind us and light another cigarette. Woo! Okay. All right. That one did not make it into the anthology, but maybe next time. <laughs> For poetry goes to the movies, maybe. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. Uh, but thank you all for being here tonight, and we do have some some books in the store. There is some wine uh, for free donation, though, uh, if you want.